I don't want to be the guy keeping us from lunch, so I'm going to go through this rather quickly. I struggled coming up with this presentation, and I'll tell you why, because I was asked to talk about big data. Raise your hand in here if you actually know what big data means. Really? I got a couple. The reality of it is I couldn't seem to find a single consistent definition for big data. So how the heck am I supposed to present on a topic when I can't even find an industry definition that everyone agrees upon? So I decided to take a bit of a, of a different tack on this. I decided to come at this and say, I'm not going to talk about big data as the marketers might talk about big data. I'm going to talk about what big data means to me, what big data means to my firm, and how we are beginning to look at the data that we own and extracting value out of that data. Now, I, I am going to take a different tack on this. As I said, I'm, I'm going to be speaking about some theory, about some background, a bit of disclosure about myself, perhaps. But ultimately, I'm going to bring it around and tell you how we got to where we are today and where we're going with this. So first of all, about Russell McVeigh. We've been in business since 1863. That's quite a long time. Um, no pressure for the exec team. You know, don't, don't want to screw that up. Uh, next year is our 150th anniversary. We regard ourselves as New Zealand's premier law firm. We're focused primarily on corporate and government. And within those sectors, we're not a commodity firm. We work on the very large deals, the very tough deals. We work on those matters that require deep expertise. We have offices in Auckland and Wellington, about 400 staff. We, were just, we just won the, the ALB's New Zealand Deal Team of the Year, a New Zealand Deal of the Year for the telecom demerger, and one of our partners, previous uh, chairman of our board, uh, Pip Greenwood, won Deal Maker of the Year. Now, what do you think of when you think of law firms, right? Innovative, exciting. Yeah, right. Law is so old, what possible innovation could there be? What possible excitement could there be? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit about this. The facts, what we have. I'll start with the, with the basics. We have about 120 terabytes of data, okay? When I heard Tim Campos get up here and speak, and I've, I've seen some of the scale... I guess, white papers that are out there talking about big data. This makes me want to do the American thing and go buy a bigger truck to drive around. I need to compensate for something. It's nothing. We have 1.4 million documents in our active document management system. We have 4 million emails currently climbing. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of boxes of hard copy. That data is still valuable. Now, how do, we, how do we grab it? What do we do with it? We've got about 300 gigs of time and billing data. And this goes against all of our fee earners, whether they be our partners, associates, senior solicitors, juniors, grads, different clients. We know who's been charging what for what matters. Does anybody in this room know what this this, this picture is what this is. A few of you might. This is called by many people the most important photograph ever taken. This is from the Hubble Deep Field. And what you see in this photograph, these points of light, are galaxies. And this is but a small section of space. Each of these galaxies contains billions of stars. When I was a kid, I used to go out at night, look up 
into the sky and just be awestruck by the complexity and really the insignificance of what we have. So when I look back and I think about the data we have, 120 terabytes, I look at this and I say, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing, and, and, and Facebook is nothing, honestly. These are problems we can solve. So when I think, though, about, about the data, there, there are some ways of, of thinking about this. And I, as I mentioned, I've got millions of emails. I've got millions of documents. I've got all these terabytes of data. It represents complexity, confusion, challenge, obfuscation, roughness, information overload, if I'm going to extract real value out of this. Chaos. But what if, what if I could turn that around and begin to understand the data, the interrelationships? Well, then the game changes. Then I have insight, and foresight. I have opportunity. I have knowledge, efficiency, clarity, and ultimately, as business people, the one thing that we want in the marketplace advantage if we understand the data that we possess better than our competitors we will stay on top have any of you read this book chaos by by james glick this book came out in the late 80s, and it was really my first introduction to chaos theory. And chaos theory, for those of you who might not be familiar, it's studying the behavior of dynamic systems, systems that are highly sensitive to initial conditions. Um, and as this says, popularly known as the butterfly effect. Chaos describes our weather patterns. We can predict weather an hour from now fairly accurately. Try that a week out, not so much. Try that two years out, not a chance. It's because of these chaotic interactions, all due to an initial set of conditions. Does anybody know what this represents? This is an equation by Benoit Mandelbrot. Many of you are familiar with Mandelbrot's work in the area of fractal geometry. And fractal geometry is a hugely important concept when you talk about managing big, complicated problems. Because you, the, the, the fractal geometry, as described by Mandelbrot, forms the Mandelbrot set, results in a graph like this. It looks simple. It looks beautiful. But boy, is it complicated. Because when you begin to do iterations and when you begin to do a deep dive, things change. And things change significantly. Things change beautifully and unexpectedly all from a very simple equation. Now, do any of you happen to know what this is? Have you been there? Do you recognize the landscape? The answer is you haven't been there, and the reason you haven't been there is because this isn't real. This is a piece of art developed by Michael Najjar. Michael is a German guy who's done some amazing work using the concepts of fractal geometry not only to produce art, but to produce art based upon chaotic systems. What you're actually looking at here is a mountain range, again built on the fractal geometry, that represents the Nikkei stock market graph from 1966 to 2009. Now, as many of you may know or you may not know, fractal geometry is hugely important to financial markets. There are literally 
thousands of physicists working on Wall Street today. And the reason they're there is because they understand that markets are not predictable. What Benoit Mandelbrot said was, clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, bark's not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a straight line. We need to assume the market is not efficient, instead a wild and complex shape. That is my starting point for understanding the data that is within our law firm. Now, where do I go from there? I look at a guy named Eric Burlow. Do any of you know, heard of Eric Burlow? Look him up. He's an interesting guy. He's an ecologist. He studies complex interactions in nature. And what he says is the more you step back and embrace complexity, the better chance you have of finding simple answers. So here's a diagram of an ecosystem. This is the starting point for a lot of biologists, and they realize that a single change anywhere in that ecosystem has ripple effects. It impacts everything else. So Burlow's gone out and created some mathematical diagrams, some computer programs to plot this. And what he's discovered is quite interesting because what you believe to be true is probably not. And that is what you think, man, that is complex. It's going to be so much easier if I just study the interactions or interactions between just two points. And what you find is that is not easier. What you find is that the chaos increases when you look at two simple points. It is only when you step back and look at the entire complexity model that you begin to be able to build patterns. You begin to be able to understand what's there. And in terms of big data, it's a little bit scary because it means that you have to go into multivariate calculations. You really begin to have to look at all of the factors impacting your data. How many of you have heard of Stephen Wolfram? Wolfram Alpha, the search engine, right? Now, I don't know how many of you have, have, have inter interacted with him. He's quite an interesting guy. He's very full of himself, but he's a very smart man. And he proposed in his book, A New Kind of Science, he, he went into the, the idea of cellular automata. The idea that starting from a few basic points, that each, I'm simplifying this, each state is affected by itself and its neighbors. This produces repeating patterns. You know, it's common sense, right? If you begin building a pattern of, of these rule sets, you'll see these patterns begin to form. And it repeats and it repeats and it repeats. But what he discovered was fascinating. That once you begin doing iterations, the simple patterns break down. No longer is the pattern regular. Now we get chaos. Now we get entropy. Now we get interesting. So, back to Russell McVeigh. What is the need? Clients want to know as closely as possible in advance what legal services are going to cost them. We don't do commodity work. We don't do simple transactions, so we can't predict and say, yes, that mortgage transaction is going to cost this, because it's not the type of work we do. We do very large, complicated transactions, many of which are one-offs, many of which are one-of-a-kind. But yet, the clients expect us to be able to tell them in advance what it's going to cost, and to be accurate about that. So we have an obligation to be accurate, thorough, and efficient to our clients. The opportunity, guess what? This is the same slide I showed you earlier. My opportunity comes in data. Our initial conditions are the matter type. The clients, relationship owners, the opposing firm or firms, our partners, associates, seniors, juniors, and grads the people working on the case. Now we begin to model this and we begin to look at this and we, we, we can say, if this partner works with this client, with these associates, these seniors, in a certain organizational pattern, certain outcomes happen. And we know this because we go back and we look at similar types of data over time. We can predict, we hope to predict, this is still a work in progress and it's not simple, um, ultimately to be able to reduce our inaccuracies in estimation, resulting in happier clients. 
So the solution, the complex relationship between matters, clients, partners, legal staff, it's hidden, it's there. We just have to tease it out. By using innovative thinking and big data concepts, we're seeking to apply the multidisciplinary uh, concepts to re redefine matter, estimation, accuracy, and client efficiencies. Takeaway for you. We talked a lot about Facebook. We, 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 we talk about these Googles. We talk about these vast enterprises. But you know what? Your business doesn't have to be cutting edge and new and exciting to take advantage of the big data concepts. A mature industry like law can do that. You don't have to be the size of Facebook. Going back, I've got 120 terabytes of data, big deal. But it's hugely important to our clients. And the message I want you to take away is think outside the box. Look outside your own industry. Look and gather the ideas that are out there and stand on the shoulders of these giants who have come before you, although maybe not in your area, your discipline. Some freebies for you. This is, uh, you can email me or um, you can get it from the slide deck. I feel obliged to speak directly to the big data concept, so there is a great free book out there from O'Reilly, those of you who know O'Reilly, Planning for Big Data, see how his handbook to the changing data landscape, and yeah, it talks about Hadoop, it talks about Microsoft's play, it talks about all that. It's a good resource and it's free. The other one is A New Kind of Science by Stephen Wolfram, again, available free online. That's all for me. Thank you so much for your time today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.